welcome today. Thank you very, very much for coming to our webinar, which today is around uh, using video for learning, particularly drama video. And um, we're, we're jumping around for the next 30 minutes on why you'd use it, how you use it to its best advantage. And Frank was, is going to give us some uh, of his um, professional insights. Frank is, an, uh, I'll let Frank introduce himself. He's an award-winning um, executive producer of Moving Image for Learning. And um, uh, we are both with you for the next uh, 30 minutes. Frank, hello. Do move forward hello. on the deck and introduce you. Yes, let's do that. Hold on a second. There we are. Um, hello, everybody. It's fantastic to see such a, uh, a sort of geographical spread on the call. I was going to say good afternoon, but it doesn't really apply to most people. Um, I'm, I'm Frank McCabe. I'm Leo's executive producer of Moving Image. What that means in practical terms is that uh, I will uh, be responsible for writing, directing and producing the vast majority of our drama work as well as chipping in and monitoring the quality of, of some of the other types of work that, that we do as well. Um, I've been, I, I did it ad hoc for a number of years at Leo, but it's been, a, it's been a formal role for about seven years now, so the team is now seven years old. Fantastic. Um, my name's Andrew Jolly, I'm Director of Strategic Design at Leo, so I lead a team of consultants. Um, the thing that I'm most excited about is how we pull together different media and channels into blended learning solutions and of course um, video is one of one of the uh, core uh, media that we use um, and nowadays it video for learning comes in many many different forms um, from video that you uh, can film on your camera um, and people are quite fine with experiencing to the kind of high quality uh, representation of real world um, and uh, the dramas that we face in the real world, um, which Frank is going to be talking about. So um, uh, I'll just say a couple of words about us. Frank, if you'd move the slide forward. I'm not going to spend too much time on, on this, but we're part of, we're, we're very um, proud to be part of a large group of learning technologies companies called Learning Technologies Group. And you'll see on the right here some of the um, products, platforms, software tools that are within the group. And we work really closely with, with those teams, including authoring tools like GOMO, um, which would uh, strongly feature the use of video as we build uh, digital learning courses as well. And on the left, we have uh, service, content and service teams uh, preloaded our gaming, um, uh, our, our company who specialises in games for learning, uh, GRC, which is governance, risk, compliance, which video is a very strong um, player in terms of solution. Leo, where Frank and I work, uh, delivering uh, award-winning learning content for, for many years. And since last October, our colleagues in GP Strategies across the world, which is really, really uh, interesting. Um, moving forward, um, the way we talk about ourselves at Leo is uh, really that we're split into three um, core offerings. The, str the strategy, which is what a lot of my team do, which is um, uh, understanding the learning needs of uh, our customers um, and ensuring that, the, that the, the solution that we develop is going to meet their needs and that we can test that and know when we've been successful. Um, we are deliverers of content. That is our our business, if you like, and we've been doing that for many, many years. Um, and we use technology in every way we can to create and deliver the learning um, uh, in a in the context of a modern learning experience in business. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, a few aspects of of drama, video, or film, as I know Frank likes to call it, um, what this means to use video for learning, why we might use trauma, uh, and then some production um, tips and tricks from Frank about how to run a smooth project and get the best out of uh, a video team. So over to you, Frank. 
Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, yeah, before we before we dive in, I, I think um, it's worth uh, just a bit of context, a bit of history. Uh, it, it feels like a really, it feels like the right time to be talking about learning dramas right now. It, it feels like it's a kind of uh, a, a hot subject for all kinds of interesting reasons. So um, my my first video project at Leo would have been 21 or 22 years ago. Uh, and in those days, for those of you old enough to, to remember, um, we used to we used to put all of our content onto CD-ROM. Uh, and we'd courier it to the client and say, there's your final deliverable, enjoy. That meant, of course, that file sizes were not just not an issue because they went directly into somebody's computer. Then LMSs emerged. Uh, and in their early form, given the kind of the infrastructure we had at our fingertips, um, video all but disappeared overnight because it couldn't really be streamed very successfully. Uh, and as LMS has got more sophisticated and our infrastructure, our hardware and software got better, it started to creep back in maybe maybe seven, eight years ago as a relatively common thing for our clients to want. So. It's grown and grown and grown since then, not, not just for us, but I think for, for a, a lot of production houses. So it's back, but it's back in a really quite a different way in some respects, um, particularly when we're, when we're talking about drama. So the, the, the clearest example I can give you is, is health and safety. We've all seen those old health and safety videos. I've made a few. They feel a bit clunky, maybe a bit cheesy sometimes. Those kind of products have totally changed because the way in which companies, organizations want to address those issues has also changed hugely. So instead of asking, how can we get these rules into people's minds? The question now is, well, we know people know the rules. Why do they break them? And that's a much more interesting, subtle, complex human problem. And so that means we're able to make much more subtle complex human dramas so it feels like as as you know that the way people treat learning changes we're obviously expected to to reflect that so given that the title of the session is meeting uh, the expectations of your learners we need to talk about heightened expectations because since the resurgence the renaissance in learning video quality has gone through the roof and the expectations of that are, are, are also really high now. And I think there are, there are two reasons for that. First one's quite simple, actually. Um, the cost of high-end equipment is now a fraction of what it was 15 or 20 years ago. If you want to make a film that you can show in a cinema and it will stand up on a huge screen like that, for the equipment to do that, you'd probably pay a tenth of what you were paying in the, in the 80s or 90s. So it's democratized filmmaking and it's got people used to seeing really high quality stuff for far lower budgets. The second reason uh, is a really interesting one. It feels to me that we are living in a, a kind of a golden age of television. So we are exposed to fantastic high-end storytelling all around us, you know, in, 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 on, on Netflix or Prime, in the cinema, on the radio, wherever it is. There are hundreds of hours a week of really good stuff being produced and, and beamed into our homes. So actually, one of the things we've had to do as a team is respond to people's uh, increased sophistication in how they understand these things. So we look at this slide in two parts. On the right-hand side are some of the, the kind of key phrases, the buzzwords, the terminology that we're used to hearing in client conversations when we're talking about a learning film. We still hear those, but what's really interesting is the stuff on the left, which you might hear in a, in a pitch meeting for a movie or a conversation between a director and a screenwriter, we're starting to hear more of that stuff now. So that dotted line in the center is kind of faded. And I think the point, the point I, I need to make here is that, that when you're thinking about commissioning a learning film, now, there is no reason you can't have everything on this slide, uh, you know, considered uh, 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 and implemented in that film. We can make films like the ones you see on TV that have that learning rigor. There is no, uh, there's no reason really for you not to have that, that quality on both sides of this 
of this slide actually. So it's two sets of techniques really increasingly. So the most fund fundamental question of all really, why drama? What can drama do that other mediums can't or can't do as well? I think there is there is a there is a kind of strand of, of, of subject matter that drama deals with just hugely better than anything else. There are a couple of quotes here, one from Nick Shackleton Jones on the left, your memory needs to be efficient. So it only stores the stuff that matters. But which stuff matters? It's the stuff that has an emotional impact. So a lot of the work that I've, I've read of Nick's is, is around um, how we feel about something affecting our, our capacity to retain it. So he's suggesting there that that emotion or feeling is a hook to memory, which is really interesting uh, when we're talking about learning films. And there's further research in that area, which is really interesting, that suggests that one of the main reasons that human beings have become more successful than other, other you know, uh, animals on the planet and more civilized and sophisticated is not that we think in a more sophisticated way, it's that we feel in a more on a more subtle palette. Um, we're, we're able to um, divine and divide our feelings in a much more uh, segmented way, which aids our memory of things. So the assumption here is that memory, memory is connected to feeling. And on the right hand side, when it comes to inspiring people to embrace a new change in behavior, storytelling isn't just better than the other tools, it's the only thing that works, which I, I believe to be absolutely true. And of course, behavior is kind of the key word for successful learning dramas. It, it's what we are dealing with most often and most strongly, and it's the thing you can't do in other mediums as easily or anywhere near as effectively, I think. So the rest of this session really is, is kind of a toolkit for you. Um, we, uh, we, will, we will think and talk and, and, and work on your products in perhaps a very slightly alien way for you. We, yeah, we, use, we use techniques and language that you may not be used to when you're commissioning other learning products. Uh, and in order for you to have better conversations and to know what it is you're looking at when you get deliverables for sign off or, or bids in, it, it's just good for you to have some of these techniques and, and terminology just to end up with a, with, a, with a better product because you've had a more rounded conversation and you, you, you're better able to evaluate what it is um, you're being sent. So if we look at the right hand side here, um, this slide's really about creating empathy. Learning films are short, typically, so we need shorthand techniques to foster strong engagement straight away. We need to get to the emotional center of an individual's problem as quickly and as effectively as we can. So almost all stories ask you to invest your emotional energy in a single character, not all, but most. So there is a subjective view on that story. And we like to try and push that in learning films really strongly so that that single perspective is very dominant. That's just a quick way of upping, kind of upping the emotional ante, really. Um, giving that person a problem and asking you to inhabit that problem with them. Empathy keys are really interesting. Um, they feel a bit cynical sometimes in, in, in movies. You watch the, the number of movies where the lead character has a has a cute pet, right? Because we all we all like people who like animals. So they'll, they'll give the hero a dog. Right? It happens all the time, and that is to foster your empathy for that character. Right? You you are likely to think well of that character because he's got a, a faithful and much loved puppy or whatever it may be. Interestingly, musical instruments is another one. We tend to like people who can play the saxophone or the piano. So there's a fair bit of that in movies as well. There's a set of those that we can use in learning dramas that are about reflecting back the workplace to the viewer in an accurate way. What we want early on is for people to, to watch these films and say, oh, that's happened to me. I nearly did that. 
So it's a recognition, a reflection back, really important as an MPPQ. Pulling motors are incidents that are unresolved early on in a film that keep people watching. So they want to find out uh, what, what the end of that little incident is or how it occurred. And we, if we talk about the increased sophistication in people's tastes these days, um, many, many more learning films now use a disrupted timeline, which we see in TV all the time. So we might see uh, a huge, great incident early on before we even see the titles. We then get the title sequence and then we're two years previously or six months later. And what, what that's doing is asking us to keep watching so that that incident is explained. The circumstances of it are then made clear. So disruptive timelines where things don't happen in their chronological order are now really common in, in learning films. Uh, and they, they can be very effective. Uh, and you should certainly consider um, how that can be used um, for, your, for your products. Styles, by which I think I probably mean genre, are really important. We consider genre a lot. People feel comfortable when they know what genre they're in. They kind of know the sort of thing to expect. Uh, and, and it frees them of a bit of kind of alienation around what is this, what, what's going to happen. They sort of know the kind of thing that will happen because they're sat comfortably in a genre. It makes their, their, their learning experience um, a bit easier and a bit more focused. So, Frank, so we talked a bit, please, Frank, yes. Um, when, you, when you use the term genre, um, do you mean sort of detective drama or comedy or something like that? Yes, I mean, we, we've done some work for a, a big um, insurance house where, as, as far as we were concerned, we were making um, a series of episodes of the soap, right? It was the same family that we revisited over yeah, every six months. We filmed another couple of episodes for you know a couple of years. So, so we worked on that as if it was a soap opera, because it basically was. Um, we've got a shoot coming up um, where we've come to We've come to the 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 uh, the kind of end point with the client that that what we're going to make for them is three episodes of a sitcom in the style of Modern Family, right? So, genre is really useful uh, as a kind of shortcut to uh, just people relaxing into things and being able to to sort of understand them and focus on them in the right way. Really. Um, so it's an important conversation to have. So um, we talked a bit about empathy. Uh, we have to find a balance and it's something that you will come up against we you know it, production houses writing dramas they tend they do have a tendency sometimes to to push things a little bit too far and we don't want to do that so if we consider that there are three main types of empathy cognitive empathy on the left is is a slightly colder empathy i understand why you what well, I, I understand where these emotions i'm seeing are coming from on the right hand side, full emotional empathy, you're feeling the same thing as the character see. So I was thinking earlier about what would an example be, and I, I think I was 11 or 12 when I saw E.T. And I was absolutely inconsolable at what happened to that poor extraterrestrial chap, right? Inconsolable, to the point where I wasn't really taking in the rest of the film. We don't want that. So the middle ground, which I'm calling rational compassion, is a mix of both of those things. And we have to hit that sweet spot. If people can stay just detached enough to absorb and observe and analyze and often come up with their own answers to these situations, that's the right place to be in. So we need to make sure when we're planning these things that we don't go off the, the diving board to the right. Um, we quite often get asked to film, you know, fairly horrific uh, accident scenarios. Um, and we never film the accident. It's just not, it's just not part of the learning experience. And if we and if we did that right and did it properly, you know, often it would be, um, you know, just too much. It's too much of a, of an empathic emotional experience, uh, and we don't want to hinder the learner in that way. Key learning moments. There are um, certain. Uh, things that you will probably you know know about uh from uh watching movies whether you know you know them or not you, you probably do and and they're to do with the shape of a story really 
So what we've got in the blue boxes at the bottom there is a, a much condensed version of the Joseph Campbell story model, which is what most Hollywood movies would use um, to construct a, a story. So we have a situation, the situation gets more difficult and a series of obstacles are created. The protagonist that we're being asked to follow and invest in is trying to solve those problems. Um, and then we see what happens uh, once those consequences are solved. The interesting thing for me about learning film is that if you take a, almost any Hollywood movie, those first three blocks are kind of the focus of the movie. The resolution phase is borderline irrelevant in a lot of cases. So famously, the third act of Jaws, the resolution, is 45 seconds long. They basically don't bother with it. However, in a learning film, that resolution, those consequences, are often the really rich learning experience. That's where the kind of learning meat is often. So we're constantly trying to push resources and focus towards that, that, that climax to resolution part, um, because that's where, that's where you know, much of the learning happens. So we do lots of branching scenarios. This is just one model of many. And what these do, Learners can, can choose their own path through a story by making decisions along the way, and they see those consequences uh, as they go. So we look at some key project questions now. I think that the big one really is where to start in a discussion with your potential vendors about video. Uh, and, and the first question, of course, is it drama at all? So we have this heart hand head model, which is culture and behaviours process and technique and marketing and comp. So if we can identify the type of material we're dealing with, we will be best placed in conversation with you to suggest the right approach. And that may not be drama. Most of our big dramas are on the left there in the culture and behavior, the subject matter that focuses on human interactions, the way people are different, the way they communicate, their, their various foibles and weaknesses and strengths. That's really rich for drama. Process less so, it can be dramatic if we get the right material, but there's not many in that middle section that are drama. Uh, and marketing and comms can be everything. That is a very broad church indeed. So we we like to start these conversations with, with that particular, uh, you know, those three brackets of material, really. There's all sorts of considerations about style and tone to do with um, whether you're demonstrating good and bad behaviours or leaving that into a more ambiguous set of learning points to which there may not be right or wrong answers. Um, uh, performances in terms of their nat naturalistic nature or otherwise, uh, where actors are gonna, are gonna pitch their work. Um, and then some technical filmmaking stuff on the right hand side. Do we want it to look real or are we making lovely frames that look beautiful? Uh, all those kind of things. But so th they're really good conversations to have early on because they inform all of our work really so just looking at what a smooth project looks like finally um it's a good idea to think of a project like this uh, video project in four phases so upfront design conversations which can, they could be lengthy conversations we need to get these things right before we dive in um we then move into pre-production which is things like script writing casting logistics uh, those kind of you know, practical things where we're, we're starting to get a sense of what it is we're going to be making. We then make it in the production phase, that's your, that's your shoot. Uh, and then post-production, which um, we found generally clients um, can be a bit hands-off in post-production because it kind of feels like it's all been done. But, but actually post-production is a hugely important part of creating meaning and feel to what, what it is we've shot. And it's worth remembering you might need lots of different experts and job roles and, and colleagues from all over um, to input into each of those those phases because they can be quite sort of specialist. Um, we like to frame all our early conversations with you around outcomes and you should too. What problem are we trying to solve is the big question and if what we're proposing doesn't do that say so. It's really important. Um, there are a huge number of small tasks that, that most production houses will ask you to Run, run the rule over uh, and uh, maybe sign off or, or, or get some sort of agreement for. So be ready for that. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's a lot of work for you guys too, actually. Uh, and don't be afraid to speak conceptually. You might have quite an abstract idea or just a visual image for something. We talk like that all the time, so we love that. 
So if something's half formed or a bit odd or a bit out there, say it because we can we can pick that up and we can we can run with that. So hopefully what I've tried to do there is give you a, a, a bit of insight into the way we think and work on on learning films um, so that you're able to um, have better conversations simply uh, about getting them commissioned. Um, there's tons more. It's a whole industry this particularly around story and structure. It's a billion dollar industry in the States. There's tons on YouTube. There's tons of books. Um, so, you know, there's plenty more info if you want to go and, and, and find it. So I think I'm going to hand back to Andrew now. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Um, we've got some really nice questions. I know that we're very, very near the, the half hour. Um, as Frank says, there's so much more to say, but I think that's been a really, really interesting introduction. We'll come to some of your questions in a minute, including the questions from Eric. Um, I just have one poll question for those of you who are here before you go. We always like to see what you'd like to hear from us next. So building on what you've heard Frank talk about, which of these, um, and my colleague Lisa is going to ask these in a poll, um, are any of these topics ones that you'd like us to speak about next? Lisa, do bring up the, the poll question. Uh, quickly so which would you like us to hear which would you like us to talk more about story structure and narrative which Frank touched on style and tone production and the management of, of, of projects like this again Frank touched on that branching scenarios we could we certainly can do a whole webinar on that um, and animation which we've not talked about hugely today but obviously there are very many different ways you can use moving image yeah. and, and you can create drama animated drama obviously um thank you very much for that lisa do um do show the responses just so, so everyone can see what what uh people are saying oh lots of people interested in animation um mm. story narrative branching scenarios which is great so we will look at those for a our next webinar in this area uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, we have got a couple of resources for you. Um, if you just move forward, Frank, to the next slide. Um, yes, indeed. Lisa is going to put up the uh, URL, the link, direct link to our resources at leolearning.com. And there's some really nice, there's an ebook there and some insights um, that go into a lot more detail on what Frank's been talking about. I'd just like to say thank you to everybody, particularly everybody who's still here listening. Um, come to us with any questions you may have. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again.